we were discussing about Laplace transform and the region of convergence in the previous class that was on Friday. Uh, we talked about various properties of the region of convergence, and then we talked about properties of Laplace transform. One thing we noted is that Laplace transform, the properties of Laplace transform is very much similar to the properties of Fourier transform. And the reason is obvious, and that is Laplace transform is actually Fourier transform of xt multiplied by e raised to negative sigma t. So that's why a lot of the properties of Fourier transform is directly inherited by Laplace transform. Additionally, we talked about initial and final value theorems. These are the two theorems that are applicable in the Laplace domain. And it requires some hypothesis. And under some hypothesis, you can look at the Laplace transform of a signal and you can figure out what the initial value of that signal is at time zero plus and what the final value of the signal is, which is at time t goes to infinity. And we looked at some examples of initial and final value, like applications of initial and final value theorems to uh, Laplace transform of certain signals. Then we talked about two specific properties of LTI system, which is causality and stability. And we figured that by looking at the Laplace transform and the region of convergence, we can actually infer information about the causality of the system itself, of the underlying LTI system. So in particular, if HS is the Laplace transform of the impulse response of the system, then uh, in the case of a causal system, the region of convergence of Laplace transform H of S is actually a right half plane. And it basically is, in the case of rational transfer function, rational HS, uh, the causality is equivalent to the region of convergence peak right half plane to the right of the rightmost pole. So to, the way to represent this would be, here is my complex plane, my S plane. This is the real part. This is the imaginary part. And I have a bunch of poles and zeros. Then the region of convergence, assuming that this system is LTI system is causal, the region of convergence would be this whole area. Okay, so the region of convergence is right half plane to the right side of the rightmost pole. So this, these are the rightmost poles and the right side of the rightmost poles is everything that happens in the positive real line. Uh, after these poles. Okay, so that was about causality. Then we talked about stability. And we said, well, if an LTI causal system is, is stable, then it means that the real part of all the poles has to be strictly less than zero. These are the poles of the transfer function HS. Okay, so this is for LDI causal system, and this is an if and only if condition, which means that if real poles is real part of the poles is less than zero, then the system LTI causal system is stable. On the other hand, if an LTI causal system is stable, then the real part of poles is strictly less than zero. Um, this is covered in much, much greater detail in ECE 3551, which I'm not sure how many of you will be taking next semester. Now, on the other hand, LTI system, I'm not talking about causal systems here, just a generic LTI system. It would be stable if and only if J omega axis lies in the region of convergence, okay? So these were the two uh, properties, causality and stability, which you can infer just by looking at the pole zero diagram of the LTI system of the transfer function H of S and by looking at where the region of convergence lies. And then we talked about differential equations for LTI system. So typically, you know, throughout this course, we have assumed that an LTI system can be represented by a constant coefficient linear differential equation whose uh, uh, system, uh, the differential equation looks like this. And uh, just like in the case of Fourier transform, or rather the frequency response of the system, you can now compute the Laplace, the transfer function of the system 
just by looking at the coefficients and uh, taking the appropriate polynomial in the numerator and the denominator. Okay, now we are going in this class, what we are going to do is look at some examples of not some examples, but actually a first order system and a second order system. And then we can infer some important information about the frequency response and the body plot of the system by looking at the pole zero diagram. And we are going to talk some, some of that. And then if time permits, we will move on to Z transform in today's class towards the end of the class. So let's look at the first order system. And this is the differential equation that I am looking at for a first order system. Of course, you can have many other types of differential equations, but with different coefficients, but this is just a standard form that we can talk about today. Okay, so what is h of s? I know you have done h of j omega. Now you just have to replace j omega with s and tell me what h of s looks like for this system. What is that symbol by the derivative? Oh, this is tau. Tau is, yeah. it's the time constant, uh, so called the time constant. The H of S would just be uh, tau S times big Y of S plus big Y equals big X. Oh, uh, so this H of S should be Y of S over X of S. Oh, oops. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go back to 32, right? So H of S is Y of S over X of S, and that's given by this expression. So that's what I'm looking for here. In that case, it would just be tau S plus one uh, over one. So just that. Well, yeah, so you, you had it the other way. So tau S plus one will be in the denominator. Okay, somebody wrote in the chat, which is the correct expression. Okay, let's, uh, so it looks like uh, uh, maybe it's uh, not obvious, or maybe you've forgotten how to compute the frequency response of a system. So let me just do the derivation very quickly. So I can take the Laplace transform on both sides of the differential equation to get tau s y of s plus y of s equals to x of s. This means y of s over x of s equals to one over tau s plus one. This is what the derivation looks like for the h of s. Now I can take the, let, uh, I'll wait for any questions and then I can talk about the impulse response of the system. Okay, so no questions. So this means I can look at the inverse Laplace transform table. And I know you are all very efficient at looking up tables now. Uh, I can do the inverse Laplace transform of H of S to get the H of T, which is E raised to negative T over tau UT. One over tau. This is the impulse response of the system.
Now imagine this is the uh, 1st of January and I give you this problem to solve. If I wanted, if I asked you to solve for the impulse response of the system, you will have to solve this differential equation using particular solution and uh, homogeneous solution and then plug in appropriate values for initial conditions in order to compute this impulse response of the system. Now it's just a cakewalk. It's just a matter of um, writing the H of S and looking up the inverse Laplace transform table to find out what the H of T looks like, the impulse response of the system looks like. So it reduced, knowing all this machinery, mathematical machinery that we have developed over this course, it has reduced the time to compute the impulse response from 40 minutes or 30 minutes to a matter of a few seconds. Okay. So this is not very uh, surprising. Uh, I could uh, do it even using the Fourier series or Fourier transform approach, in which case my H of J omega would be one over tau J omega plus one. And I can do the inverse Fourier transform to compute to compute the impulse response using the Fourier transform approach. And this is something that we have talked about uh, maybe four or five weeks back. Okay, so what's the big deal? Uh, I mean, what we could do using Fourier transform, we can now do using Laplace transform, what's the big deal? So let's talk about the big deal part here. Okay, let's consider another differential equation. This is another LTI causal system. The only difference is now I have a negative sign here. The only difference is this negative sign. In the previous expression, I had the positive sign. In this expression, I have the negative sign. Okay. Now let's look at the, so I'm not going to use the Fourier transform. Let's use the differential equation approach. Let me just write. homogeneous plus particular plus initial condition would imply that the impulse response of the system is one over tau e raised to t over tau ut. This goes to infinity as t goes to infinity. This is an unstable system. What is H of J omega? H of J omega, if you recall, was the Fourier transform of H of T. What is H of J omega here? Would it be one over tau j omega minus one? Okay. So one possible answer is, would it be one over tau j omega minus one? Which is something that we have studied in the context of uh, Fourier, like the Fourier frequency response of LTI systems before. 
any anyone else has any comments to make no comments okay so let's let's think about it i want to plot this h of t as a function of time and it's going to look like a growing exponential I have a question. Yes. Um, can't we not uh, like use take the Fourier transform because the area is infinite? Right. So what what's your what's your comment? Um, I just I don't think the transform would be one over tau j omega minus one. Okay. So there is another thought that maybe this is not correct. Okay. And what's your reasoning? Um, one of the Dirichlet conditions is that the right. area should not approach infinity. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, so the so H of t does not satisfy Dirichlet condition. That's right. So the remark or observation is H of t does not satisfy Dirichlet's conditions. Because one of the Dirichlet condition is for the Fourier transform to exist, the Dirichlet condition is that the signal itself has to be integrable. Now, if you look at H of t and you look at the area under the curve, that's going to infinity. So therefore, H of t is not integrable. And therefore, the Fourier transform does not exist. So this whole thing is, is not possible. It's not possible because the Fourier transform of H of t does not exist. So now we have a problem. We have a problem that if I have an unstable system, I can't talk about the frequency response and all the cool stuff that we did in the, in the Fourier transform chapter. Okay, we can't say anything because it's unstable. So therefore, uh, Fourier transform is undefined for the impulse response of the system. And therefore, the frequency response of the system is not well defined. Okay, thank you. So, so we need an alternative method which does not require this integrability condition, or at least the integrability condition is not very stringent. And it turns out that Laplace transform solves that problem because in Laplace transform, we can uh, multiply the signal by e raised to negative sigma t so that the signal multiplied by e raised to minus sigma t becomes integrable. And so now I can take the Laplace transform of this whole thing. So I have tau dy over dt minus yt equals to xt. This is an unstable system. I can take the Laplace transform tau s ys minus ys equals to xs. And that gives me h of s equals to one over tau s minus one. And this is well defined. Okay, and that's the power of Laplace transform. I don't necessarily need my system to be stable. Even if I have an unstable system, I can still use Laplace transform to compute the transfer function of the system. Okay, questions.
Okay. So now, of course, in real life, we have a lot of systems that are stable, that, that could be stable or that could be unstable. We don't know a priori. And because we don't know about it a priori, it's actually very cool to have Laplace transform in our arsenal because I could use this Laplace transform methodology to, uh, to come up with, let's say, a controller for the entire system so that everything becomes stable. Um, now, of course, I don't know whether you have done this inverted pendulum experiments or not, but inverted pendulum is an inherently unstable system. Two examples of inverted pendulum are human beings because we walk on two legs. So if you're standing, you are basically an unstable, uh, you are an unstable system. And the reason that why we don't just fall off is because our ears and you know, we, have an, we have a lot of sophisticated control system within our body to make sure that we don't fall off. And if any of those uh, sensors or actuators have a problem, we will fall down. So for instance, if your leg, leg you know, if, you're, if you have a muscle atrophy in your legs, you will not be able to stand on your feet. And that's because your, our, our body is inherently unstable when we are standing up. Okay. Um, the other example of this inverted pendulum example is a Segway. A Segway, I'm not sure if you've used Segway or not, but, uh, but I have actually in the past and it's an unstable system and it's stabilized using sophisticated controller on the Segway itself. The third unstable system, inverted pendulum type unstable system is a rocket. It's a highly unstable, I mean, it's, it's a very unstable system. And uh, you can look at, uh, Tesla had a demonstration, not Tesla, sorry, SpaceX, had a demonstration of uh, this reusable rockets. And you can actually see that in the first few tests, the rockets actually couldn't, couldn't uh, come back to its base and, and stand upright. And then it took several attempts to get the rocket to stand uh, on its feet um, after, after launching the vehicle in the space. So you can look at some of those videos online. These are all inverted pendulum type systems that are inherently unstable. And one uses sophisticated control schemes to stabilize the system. And all of that analysis is feasible because we have Laplace transform in our arsenal. If we didn't have Laplace transform, we couldn't really talk about those systems in a mathematically precise way or, and design controllers. And that's why this is the starting point of EC 3551, where you talk about controller design to make unstable systems stable. Okay. Any questions so far? Hopefully all of you understand this inverted pendulum example that I alluded to several times in the previous class and today's class. I might share with you the rocket videos. Uh, I didn't pull it up in for today's class, but it's instructive to know what instability means and how people have mastered stabilizing unstable systems. Okay. So what else? Oh yeah. So what's the relationship between H of S and H of J omega? So let's assume a stable system. So if you have a stable causal LTI system, then both H of S and H of J omega is uh, well-defined. Now, this is my S plane. This is the real part. This is the imaginary part. Here is my J omega. Okay, so G this is J zero. This is J infinity. And somewhere in the middle lies J omega. And this is my minus one over tau. So this is the pole of the first order system we just talked about. Okay. 
Now, what's the region of convergence for this particular system? So I know that it's a causal LTI system. So therefore, the region of convergence would be anything in the right of the rightmost pole. So one minus one over tau is the rightmost pole. So anything right of this is the region of convergence. So therefore, this H of J, this J omega point lies within the region of convergence. And therefore, H of J omega is well defined. Okay. No questions so far. So let me remove this region of convergence part. Now I want you to uh, think about this quantity, this theta and the length of this line segment. So this line segment connects J omega to minus one over tau in the complex plane. So someone wants to tell me what the value of theta is and what the magnitude of this line segment, what the length of this line segment is. Let's actually go back to uh, the complex plane, like just a second, just a small detour. So I have a complex plane here. I have two complex numbers, Z1 and Z2. What is the length of this line segment? And what's the angle with respect to the horizontal? So I want to know the length L and then theta. Anyone remembers from your complex analysis or complex variables class. Okay, I see a message in chat. So tan theta equals to minus omega tau. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about this specific example of Z1, Z2. Okay, let me tell you the answer. You can certainly check when you go back home. So the length is actually absolute value of Z1 minus Z2 and theta is the angle of Z1 minus Z2. Okay, so this is something that you should all remember from your complex variables class. So the length of the line connecting two complex numbers is basically the absolute value of the difference and the angle is uh, z1 minus z2. Now let's change the orientation here. Let's say this is z1 and this is z2. The length remains unchanged, but now the angle of z1 minus z2 is actually this angle. Theta. That's the angle of Z1 minus Z2. Okay. Everyone remembers this. So going back to the original problem, what's the theta here and what's the length L here? Thank you. 
So let me apply this idea. So this is the length is absolute value of J omega minus minus one over tau. And the angle is theta is equal to angle J omega minus minus one over tau. Does everyone agree with it? Okay, I'm just applying this formula from complex variables class. Okay. Okay, so we all know that the length is absolute value of j omega plus one over tau and theta is angle of j omega plus one over tau. Now let's look at my h of j omega, which is one over tau j omega plus one, which is equal to one over tau one over j omega plus one over tau. So what is absolute value of H of J omega? That will be one over tau times one over L. What is angle of H of J omega? So remember J omega plus one over tau is in the denominator. So this is negative angle J omega plus one over tau, which is minus theta. Okay, so in chapter six, if I were given this value of this expression for H of J omega, I would have to spend some time plotting this absolute value of H of J omega and the angle of H of J omega um, in the form of a Bode plot. And that's when I can figure out whether it passes low frequencies or not, whether it passes high frequencies or not, and things like that. The good thing here in this situation is now I see that the absolute value of H of J omega is inversely proportional to the distance between the pole and the J omega point. And the angle, the phase, diff, the phase angle of H of J omega is actually negative theta, negative value of the uh, angle it makes between the J omega and the minus one over tau between the pole and the J omega point on the imaginary axis. So now let's go back to the S plane. This is L, this is theta. So when J omega is small, the, what's the value of theta when omega is small? So this is when omega is small. I get it approaches zero as it gets smaller. Yeah, yeah. So theta is almost zero as omega becomes smaller and smaller. And if you look at the length L, the L doesn't really change much as you increase the value of omega from small number to a reasonably small number. 
So as you move from here, so you start from J0 and you're moving in this direction, the value of L is not really changing much in the beginning and the theta is also close to zero. And as you move towards infinity, of course the L becomes very large. So if L becomes very large, then the absolute value of H of J omega becomes very, very small. So this system is rejecting high frequency. So this is high frequency, this is omega high. So because the L is very large, the system is going to reject high frequencies because this L becomes very large. And when omega is very large, the theta approaches 90 degrees. And so angle of J omega would be minus 90 degrees. So the phase difference we are going to see would be minus 90 degrees for high values of omega. Okay. So this pole zero diagram turns out to be a very, very important tool because by looking at the pole zero diagram and by looking at these, uh, these angles and the magnitude, you can actually figure out with some experience, I mean, I'm not saying that it's too obvious as the first time you see it, but with some experience in this sort of reasoning, you can come up with a rough idea of which frequencies the system is going to reject and which frequencies the system is going to pass through without any attenuation. Okay, so that's the first very important implication of this pole zero diagram and the region of convergences in the Laplace transform domain. Okay, let me go through this uh, whole exercise once more. So when my omega is small, when my omega is small, my L is not changing much and my theta is close to zero. So uh, I'm gonna pass most of the frequencies without much attenuation for small values of omega and the phase difference is gonna be very close to zero. And as I become, as the frequency becomes higher and higher, my theta approaches 90 degrees. So my phase difference would be minus 90 degrees. Remember this is minus theta. And my L becomes very large because omega is high. So L becomes very large. And if L is very large, then it means that the absolute value of H of J omega will become very small. And therefore the system will reject high frequency signals. And we can infer this whole thing just by looking at the pole zero diagram. and thinking about it a little bit more carefully. Okay. Let's look at another important point in this pole zero diagram, like continuing the discussion with this pole zero diagram. So let's call it one over tau one minus one over tau. Okay, well, can't do that on the same space. I'm going to make us sm two smaller plots. So I have two systems. Okay, and so my H of T is one over tau e raised to minus T over tau, tau one u tau u T. And here, H two of T is one over tau two.
So here tau one is small. And tau two is large. Let me plot this H one and H two T. No, not there. Okay, after you have written it down, just see what, what's happening to the impulse response of the two systems and try to connect it to, you will notice that there are differences, obvious differences between the graph for H1 and H2. And I want you to compare it with the location of poles in the pole zero diagram for this system. What do you notice? Would it be as tau decreases, the smaller tau is, the more ideal the uh, impulse function is? Well, it's not, it's not about ideal, but I think what you mean is it responds very fast to the input. Does that, what do you mean by ideal? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so fast response. Let me write it. Fast response, and this is slow response to the input. Okay, so you have recognized that as tau increases, the response becomes sluggish. The response becomes slower and slower. Now let's try to connect it to the location of the pole um, in the pole zero diagram. So we see that this distance is very large and the larger this distance is, the faster the response of the system is. So I'm looking at the location of the pole with the imaginary axis, right? So, so if the pole is far away from the imaginary axis, then the response is much faster. If the pole is very close to the imaginary axis, then the response is slower, okay? So again, by looking at the pole zero diagram and looking at the relative position of the pole with respect to the imaginary axis, I can actually say with quite a bit of confidence how quickly the system is going to respond to inputs. Okay, another very cool insight, which just by looking at, you know, the differential equation, nothing is clear, none of this is clear by looking at the differential equation, whether the impulse response is going to be fast or slow, but by looking at the pole zero diagram of the system, I can actually infer how quick the response is going to be um, based on the location of poles and its distance to the imaginary axis. These are all stable LTI systems, by the way. I'm not talking about unstable systems yet. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, so let me write here the key 
take away So a pole that is far away from imaginary axis, if poles are poles are far away from the imaginary axis, the system will respond very quickly to inputs. Pole is close to the imaginary axis, the system is not going to respond very quickly to inputs. It's going to take some time for the system to get to the steady state. Okay. One can argue, one can do the same uh, business with the second order system. Here the system transfer function is, this is a standard second order system. Of course, you can have uh, different types of second order systems as well. the pole zero diagram looks like this. This is for zeta less than one. Okay, I'll let you guys write and then I'll go to the, okay, well, I'll just do this. Now you can again do that J omega business. You can look at this, these two lengths. You can look at this theta one and oh. This is theta one, this is theta two. So you can look at all the, uh, you can come up with the uh, the frequency characteristics of the system by looking at this length to L1 and L2. And you can come up with the phase characteristics by looking at theta one and theta two. And uh, for zeta greater than equal to one, you can do again the same thing. And you will come up with the frequency and the, uh, sorry, the magnitude as well as the phase characteristics of the system with respect to various values of omega. And then of course, how quickly the system is going to respond? Well, if these poles are close to the imaginary axis, then the system will respond very slowly to the inputs. If the poles are farther away from the imaginary axis, the system is going to respond very um, fast to the inputs. In the case of zeta greater than one, we have two different poles. So the system response will be dominated by the poles that is closest to the imaginary axis. So the response will be dominated by this pole. So if this pole, the dominant pole, this is actually, this is called a dominant pole. There is a very specific name, which is dominant pole, the pole that is closest to the imaginary axis. So the system response is dominated by the dominant pole. 
And if the dominant pole is close to the imaginary axis, the system will be sluggish. If the dominant pole is far away from the imaginary axis, then the system will be very quick. Very quick, it will quickly respond to inputs. And none of this information was feasible. Like we couldn't have come up with all this information again without actually developing all this machinery of Laplace transform. Until we talked about Laplace transform, all of this was very, very elusive. And now it all becomes very obvious. Of course, it requires some effort for you to do some assignments and solve a few problems with Laplace transform. But once you do it, and you will have ample opportunity to do it if you take 3551. Uh, you will see that it's very, very useful concept. By the way, my 3551 lectures are also on YouTube. You can go to my channel and look at 3551 videos as well, where I cover about some of these things in much greater detail. Any questions so far? Oh, there seems to be a chat. Okay, so if there are no questions, I won't start. I, I was planning to start Z transform today, but it seems like I'm out of time. So let's start uh, about talking about the Z transform in the next class, which will be on Wednesday. And a reminder, Quiz four is next Monday at this time. So please make sure that you prepare well for quiz four. Um, and the motivation for Z transform is exactly the same as the motivation for Laplace transform. So Fourier transform for discrete time signals is not good enough for many different types of signals. And so we need to talk about Z transform for covering a large set of stable and unstable systems. Uh, to analyze. So we'll talk about Z transform in the next class. Thank you for your attention and see you in, see you on Wednesday. What lectures is the quiz going to cover? I had sent an email about it. Uh, I'll have to, I'll have to see. Let's say lecture 22, chapter six, all the way up to lecture 27. No. Lecture 22 to lecture, uh, lecture 22 to lecture 29, 22 to 29, yeah.